like, I mean, his China policy, the fact that he came out with a statement this on the Uyghurs, Biden. I thought it was very strong. You know, it's one of the stronger things he did, but it's not coming up in the polls. And I think the whole Republicans interested in getting nobody Hillary cares to run about, again is no, 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 Nobody cares about what's happening to the Uyghurs, okay? You you bring it up because you really what? care. And I think what that's nice that cares? you care. The rest of us don't care. I'm just well, telling you a very care? hard. Wait, wait, I'm you're telling you, you a very, personally don't care. I'm telling you a very hard, ugly truth. Okay, of all the things that I care about, yes, it is below my line. Wow. So he doesn't care about the Uyghurs. He doesn't care about the Uyghurs. Um, of all the things he cares about, this is below his line. And this is what freaked the world out. I mean, this little clip, this video of him saying it's below my line, has been playing over and over again all over Twitter. Uh, all over the place. It's been on uh, national television. It's been on the news shows. It's been everywhere because how dare him? How dare he does say he doesn't care? Now, there's a question of how much he doesn't care what that actually means. But there's something really honest and truthful here. How many of you care beyond a broad, abstract caring? Yes. You know, it's, 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 it's bad that it's happening. Uh, it's immoral that it's happening. It's, it's bad that the Chinese are doing this. We'll get to afterwards where some of these people are actually questioning whether the Chinese are actually doing this stuff or not, or whether it's basic propaganda. But basically the point here is, if you want to interpret it the way I would interpret it, I'm not sure this is what he means, is, look, I'm busy living my life. I've got concerns about how to live the best life that I can live. Uh, this is a, a, an egoistic perspective. I don't really care in a sense that it's going to uh, make a dent in my life or I'm going to invest money or time or significant thought or change my opinion about Biden because of the Uyghurs. Now, uh, you know, it's probably overstated because suddenly I've talked about the Uyghurs and I've talked about the fact that it's a travesty and it plays a role in my evaluation of China. But I'm a professional intellectual. I'm kind of paid to do this. This is what I do. For 99% of the people out there, for 99% of the people who are like Chamath Polyhopati, Tia, Tia, something like that. Anyway, um, the Uyghurs have no relevance to their life. Uh, the fact that a horrible injustice is happening on the other side of the world is horrible in some sense. And on the other hand, it, it is not going to stop you from engaging in life. These kind of things have been happening. The human race has been engaged in these kind of behaviors forever. Uh, it, it, again, is, is, is sad at the, at the margin, but I'm not going to lose sleep over it. I'm not going to change my day-to-day -day behavior for it. I'm not sending money to organizations to advocate against Uyghur genocide, although I think it would be fine if you did. Uh, to what extent should it change behavior? And, and it's, it's, it's fascinating to me that Everybody was upset by this, and yet everybody behaves as if what he just said is true. Nobody literally changes their day-to-day -day life, their day-to-day -day activity. Nobody actually changes the values in their life, or very few people do, because of what's going on among the Uyghurs. People have problems in their own lives. They have relationship problems, they have monetary problems, or they just have the challenge of living a good life and pursuing a great life. So there's something very self-interested about this, and there's certainly something very honest about it. Because what he's not doing is doing the regular thing that people out there do, which is virtue signal. They'll say, oh, I care about the Uyghurs, and then they don't do anything, don't really act on it, doesn't change their life one way or the other. And the nice thing about this is he doesn't project any guilt about it. He doesn't project any guilt about it. What is going on in the chat right now? 
this discussion about cookies and about Arab bakeries. Well, there's some good Arab bakeries in Michigan, but really, we're talking about serious stuff. <laughs> All right, it's, it's distracting me. I'm, I'm getting hungry uh, watching this. All right, so uh, I, I think this is fascinating. I think it's interesting that um, the way the world responded to this, the, the, the people went apoplectic about this. Uh, no need to say you're sorry, Jennifer. It's fine. Um, but uh, let, let's, let's listen to more of this because I think, I think the exchange between them now becomes really, really, really interesting because I think uh, you can see different attitudes, different way of viewing the world, different view of doing the world, uh, uh, you know, from the attitude now towards this statement that has been, uh, that has been made. Nobody cares about the Uyghurs. It doesn't make my list of things that I care about right now in my life. Okay, well, of all the things that I care about, it is below my line. Disappointing. Well, we, I think people, if you, if you explain to them what's happening to the Uyghurs in China, they care, but it's not top of mind for them. That's well, of course not. Why would it be top of mind for anybody? It's in China. It's far. Uh, these horrible things happen. You don't have any control over it. And again, life should be about not about trying to solve every problem around the world and, and, and weeping and caring about every injustice that happens around the world. It's about living. It's about the positive values that life involves, that life requires. It's not What's caring. top of mind right now is they go to the grocery store and, and the shelves are empty. Yeah. And, and prices, I mean, these guys are all pretty wealthy, but prices are significantly higher. And while their wages are higher, they're not as high as the prices have gone up. Stephanie asked, are Muslims the victims in this scenario? Yes, the Muslims are definitely the victims uh, among the Uyghurs among, in, in Western China. Sure, that I care yeah. about. Yeah, I, I, I care about the fact that our economy could turn on a dime if China invades Taiwan. I care about that. I care about climate change. You know, I care about a bunch of, I care about America's crippling and, you know, decrepit in healthcare infrastructure. But if you're asking me, that, do I care about a segment of a class of people in another country? Not until we can take care of ourselves will I prioritize them over us. Now notice that, that not until we take care of ourselves. And, and, and this is the problem, and, and you'll see this later on in the conversation. Basically it's saying, not, uh, you know, I care about my, my life. I care about my values. There's enough there to consume uh, most of my thinking. There's enough there to consume most of any human being's thinking is how to live the best life that he can uh, in the world that exists around him. His perspective is, and you'll see more of this, we have a lot of problems here. There are a lot of real issues here. Now, those issues affect me. So I care about them more. Justifiable, absolutely. If I solve all those problems, will all the issues that affect you go away? Of course not. He's leading towards a moral equivalency between U.S. and China. We have problems, they have problems, we do bad things, they do bad things, which is really, really bad. But nobody focused on that. None of the criticism of him was focused about the moral equivalence, equivalency he's about to make, or the, the, the whole group of them are about to make. The only guy who stands up for America, funnily and ridiculously enough, is the leftist. All of, the altruistic leftist, all of them um, make moral equivalency between the United States and China, and nobody was upset about that. What they're upset about is that he said he doesn't care about the Uyghurs in the context of his life, in the context of all the things he cares about. What can be done uh, to help the Uyghurs practically, Wanda Freeman asks. Well, I mean, you could stop buying stuff from China, from that region in China. Uh, U.S. manufacturers, U.S. Uh, companies could all leave that section in China. They could leave China completely. We could boycott China completely. We could shut off trade with China in order to help the Uyghurs. We could, 
at the very extreme of this, we could go to war with China to liberate the Uyghurs, right? So you could, you could go, there's a whole array of things that can be done. I know a lot of people who believe we should have entered World War II, not because necessarily Hitler was going to be a threat to the United States ultimately, which is a legitimate reason, and we could argue about whether that's a good, a good reason, but a legitimate one. No, but because we needed to go there to stop the genocide, you know, the Holocaust against the Jews. Well, if there's something like a Holocaust going on with the Uyghurs in China, would those same people justify a war with China in order to stop it? So there's a whole variety of things that can be done. How much of your life are you willing to give up in order to do it? All right, let's uh, keep watching. And I think a lot of people believe that, and I'm sorry if that's a hard truth to hear, but every time I, I say that I care about the Uyghurs, I'm really just lying if I don't really care. That's good, because, because most people lie all the time. People lie all the time about these things. It's what we call virtue signaling, right? I know Hitler declared war in the United States, and that's we should have entered at that point. There was no, yeah, of course we should have. But uh, the question was, should have we entered a year or two before that? Um, what he's calling out, which I think is very good, is the kind of virtue signaling that everybody engages in, right? Everybody engages in. And so I'd rather not lie to you and tell you the truth. It's not a priority for me. And my response to that is, I think it's a sad state of affairs when human rights as a concept globally, you know, falls beneath, you know, tactical and strategic issues that we have to have. We need That's to have another a high water belief. That It's a luxury belief, right? So, so the perspective that he's taking is not that the belief is wrong, not that the altruist leftist wants everybody to be a bleeding heart and everybody to really care and everybody to do something about it and to rise up and, and make a big deal out of this. And, and I think our political leaders should make a big deal out of this from the bully pulpit, right? Um, but the argument is not that's wrong, that's philosophically wrong. But it is, that's a luxury belief. That is what, you know, and generally you could view altruism as a luxury belief. Once you're taking care of yourself and, and, and you've got a lot of money and uh, you're, living, you're living a good life, then you can start sacrificing for other people, caring about other people in this deep sense. That, that's the perspective. It's not to dismiss altruism, but to say, look, right now we're trying to survive, although it's kind of funny because he's a billionaire, so he's not trying to survive. Um, and and uh, the problems that America has seem like problems of wealth, problems of the rich kid in town. Uh, and so the whole framing of this from their perspective is wrong. It's altruism as a moral ideal, and these guys are kind of cynical. Eh, we don't actually care. And then, and then you'll see some of them will actually say, eh, we don't even think it's a problem. That's another luxury belief. But I don't believe believing in the, the human declaration of human rights that Eleanor Roosevelt it's created a luxury with the United belief. Nations. I don't think it's a luxury belief to believe that all humans should have a basic set of human rights. I that think it's a, a luxury belief. Right. Is by, is, by the way, the, the declaration of human rights is terrible. It's, uh, it's a completely statist view of individual of rights it's not the view a lockean or jeffersonian view of individual rights at all at all yeah i mean there's a sense in which he's virtue signaling um maybe not about the Uyghurs, but about common americans about the prices going up in the, in the grocery store because for him it doesn't matter right um but he can't completely not be altruistic, right? He has to give some credence to some moral code. The problem is they don't have a moral code. The, 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 most of these guys in Silicon Valley, and the left is clearly is a committed altruist, but the rest of them are pragmatists. Far and the reason it. I think it's a luxury belief is we don't do enough domestically to actually express that view in real tangible ways. So until we actually clean up our own house, the idea that we step outside of our borders with, you know, 
with with us sort of like morally virtue signaling about somebody else's human rights track record is deplorable. Look at the number of black and far brown men deplorable. that are in Far from deplorable. I mean, think about this. What he's basically saying here is, and this is what I find horrific about him. What he's saying here is, we commit human rights violations, right? We, we commit human rights violations. We are bad. We've got big problems. We treat people horribly. Who are we to step out of our borders and give moral advice to other people? Now, that's deplorable. It's funny because here the leftist is the one calling him on it, right? The leftist is going to be the one defending America, which is, which is kind of funny. Look at the number of black and brown men that are incarcerated for, for absolutely ridiculous crimes. Yeah, but, but think about that. Uh, I agree that way too many people are incarcerated, black, brown, white, yellow, green, no matter what. There are way too many people incarcerated, primarily from victimless crimes, drug crimes, and so on. Uh, uh, lots and lots and lots of them. But they broke the law. Uh, you know, and, and it's a law that China has against drug trading and drug use. Of, it's a bad law, but it's not as bad as laws against free speech, laws against your religion, to morally equate what Americans do and what Chinese do is absurd and ridiculous. We don't run concentration camps. We don't run re-education camps. We put people in jail who break the law. We have standards, or standard might be wrong. The laws are terrible. So, unfortunately, in spite of the fact that I sympathize with his original statement. He goes completely downhill from here. And of course, nobody cares about this. This they all agree with. But his moral equivocation between the United States and China is absurd and ridiculous. And that's what he should be ashamed of. We are not an authoritarian regime yet. We're not an autocracy. We, we, we don't have one man rule. And we don't have concentration camps. We don't harvest prisoners' organs and sell them on the black market as they do in China, or the, maybe it's not a black market. I don't know if you saw this past week, but there was a person that was released from jail because he couldn't even be protected in jail because in some of these cells, they run these fight clubs inside of Rikers Island that are basically tacitly endorsed by the corrections officers that don't do anything. And the difference? Well, this is, this is horrible, the fact that stuff like that exists. But there's a huge difference, one of which will be articulated right now. So, hold on, Jason. So if you want to talk about the human rights of people, I think we have a responsibility to take care of our own backyard first. First. And then we can go and basically morally tell other people how they should be running their own countries. The, I mean... There's a real truth there in a sense, and this is the, the, the example I always give, that if America becomes a shining city on the hill, if America actually lives up to its promise, if America lived up to its declaration of independence, if it becomes a moral standard for the world, then our bully pulpit would mean something. It would actually have power. It would have significance. So he's right in the sense, this is why all these issues are nuanced, right? He's right in the sense that as long as we're violating rights, as long as we're not a completely free country, why, you know, should our leaders be lecturing the rest of the world? Well, yes, because there's a big difference between how bad things are here, and they're bad, and how bad they are in China, orders of magnitude worse. And again, to make the moral equivalency is horrible. To not see the, the difference in kind between what we do in the US with all the potential injustices that are involved and what China does to its own citizens and not see the difference in kind there 
is to be woefully blind. It's to be woefully, um, you know, blind. Blind is a good word. Evasive. The difference is, Chamath, saying what you just said in China or Saudi Arabia would put you in jail and get That's you 100 right. lashes and That's you would right. be tortured for a decade. We here in the United States are far from perfect. We still have the death penalty, which is against the United Declaration of Human Rights, which we signed, which Eleanor Roosevelt created in the UN. And we propagated as Americans around the world. We started that, Chamath. And we can have these discussions about being better in this country. And the whataboutism that you're proposing is so um, disproportional to the equivalent of the Holocaust going on. We're talking about a million Uyghurs in concentration camps right now. To talk about what we have here that we need to fix and compare it to that or to Saudi Arabia whipping bloggers and throwing gay people off roofs for being gay, the, these two things are not morally comparable. I agree with him. I agree with the leftist. They're not morally comparable. The difference is in kind. And, and not recognize that and not being willing to say that's evil what's going on there. It doesn't, it, it, it's not going to change my life. But it is evil what's going on there. And we can judge it and we can morally condemn it. And the fact that he won't do that is a horrible weakness in, um, in Chamath's perspective. They are very far. And we need to have open discussions and talk about human rights all the time. Because if we do not talk about it all the time, then your position, which is, I don't have time for that, I want to solve my problems, then gives the green light to dictators everywhere that nobody's watching. That's we need to true. have vigilance. And, that, and that's what I find, and I, I think we wait, need wait, to wait, work. So I, I agree with that. I think we do need to have, be able to say that. We also need to be honest enough to say, we're going to focus on our own problems. We can't control what's going on over there. We're going to focus on our own problems. We're not going to sacrifice to solve the problems over there. We're going to focus on our own problems. We're going to condemn it morally and focus on our own problems. Hold um, on a second. Your that, position. That, that's not what I said, and that's not true. You said you can't get up for it. Yeah. So tell, tell me how. Problem. Are you are you saying that the the situation with the Uyghurs uh, is the same as the Holocaust? People who are Jewish are making that comparison. You never no, no, make no, a no. Holocaust I'm asking, comparison. I'm asking you. I think it is speaking, comparable. There are uh, upwards of a million people in a concentration camp right now. This is getting to numbers that are actually comparable. It, it's not quite comparable. The million people in a concentration camp are not being. Um, gassed to death. Uh, we're not killing millions of people in an industrial fashion as the Nazis did. And it was a lot more than 6 million Jews. It was, it was 10 to 12 million total people just gassed and killed in an in a, uh, industrial manner. That's not what the Chinese are doing. So again, exaggeration is very little nuance and reason and rationality and facts and a proper moral perspective on these things from almost anybody in the culture. It is actually a valid comparison. You're saying there are a million people in a concentration camp? Th that is the numbers that human rights organizations are saying. Between 300,000 and a million people are incarcerated right now, being tortured, raped, and in doing forced sterilization, re-education, and when they're released are being tracked in ghettos. And so are Jewish you saying the entire world- Jewish people are bringing world? this up. Hold on. Are you saying, As a the comparison. You're saying the entire world has basically decided that that doesn't matter? You just said you can't get up for it. I'm talking about you specifically. Who, but who is, getting up, well, who is getting up for it? I am very up on it. I talk about it all the time, okay. every week. What about the U.S. government? What are they doing about it? The Biden just said we are going to do a ban and we are going to uh, sanction companies that do business in that region. So Apple and, and uh, Tesla? I think there will be increased pressure on all companies that are engaging in China over well, human it's, rights. It's, it's goods that are sourced from those areas, right? Correct. Yes. It's and not I doing think business that's a first there. Step. It's, it's, it's if your supply chain comes from that area. Correct. Then and it's a, it's a first step. So kind of step. like we won't, we won't buy Nazi goods, but we're, we'll sell our iPhones into Nazi Germany. <laughs> well, if you want to have a discussion about this, you know, it's how do we disengage from China? We've had this discussion here. How, what amount of time will it take to disengage from countries that have brutal dictatorships that are committing human rights atrocities. But again, my look, look, I, I, I think I'm spending a lot of time and money actually trying to fortify America's supply chain. You guys know about some of the things that I'm Absolutely. doing. Absolutely, it's I'm fantastic. Not, I'm, I'm not doing that from a moral perspective. I'm doing that from a practical capitalist perspective. I think the jobs are better served for Americans, 
And I think that we should have the ability to build our own businesses, just like China has the right to do for themselves, without the risk of these things being undercut by policies that we don't understand, which is effectively what you do when you outsource your supply chain to countries where you're not 100% aligned with them. Yeah, and they're dictatorships. So I, again, I'm not, I, I, I'm not even sure that, that it, China is a dictatorship the way that you want to call it that. So he's not sure China's a dictatorship? How is it not a dictatorship? I mean, it's really bizarre. It's really, it's really bizarre, right? How is China not a dictatorship? Again, I think communist that communist country that's in the name. Look, you have to understand, Jason. Th there are a set of checks and balances here on China that, you know, at the end of the day, what checks? And I balances? don't think that I have the moral absolutism to judge China. See, he doesn't have the moral absolute to judge China. All of this is done. All of this is approached for practical non-moralistic, non-moral absolutist perspective. You know, yeah, who can judge? Who can know? I think that America's better off with the supply chains over here, but who knows? Uh, and, and I'm not going to judge the Chinese, and China's not a dictatorship. What's the definition of a dictatorship? Is one man rule? Uh, no say for the population? Breaking up businesses whenever they want? And I would say that when NATO is silent, the United Nations is silent, all of Western Europe is silent. So the standard is when other people speak, uh, the standard is what the United Nations does. Right. And America is effectively silent, that this issue may be small data points being extrapolated in a way to create a narrative that may be not be true. And if it is true, Jason, there is a responsibility for those body politics to do something because that is the early warning signal that the rest of the world uses to say, Okay, hold on. Let me reprioritize re my list of things. So, yeah, so I guess what I'm saying is I am not going to be an armchair journalist on this topic, nor am I going to be the armchair human rights advocate for the world, because I just don't know. I can focus on the things that I know about, build the things that I know about. And if something really does get red light status, then other parties will do something. And again, I just want to be clear. NATO is silent. United Nations is silent. America is silent. A press release doesn't change the actual technical posture on these topics. Okay. Now, I, I agree with him again. It, it is such a mixture, but this is typical of pragmatists, right? He's just focused on his, what he can do, uh, his life, his projects. And since the rest of the world doesn't care, since the United Nations doesn't care, since uh, uh, nobody else seems to care, he's not going to care. I mean, you got to judge for yourself, particularly in the world in which we live. The United Nations cares about a lot of things I'm not sure he should care about. Um, it, it, again, I find it fascinating to hear this kind of mixed signals, uh, uncertainty, and real, real pragmatism. Real pragmatism. Thank you for listening or watching The Iran Brooks Show. If you'd like to support the show, we make it as easy as possible for you to trade with me. You get value from listening. You get value from watching. Show your appreciation. You can do that by going to yourownbookshow.com slash support, by going to Patreon, subscribe star, locals, and just making a appropriate contribution uh, on any one, of those, uh, any one of those channels. Also, if you'd like to see the Iran Book Show grow, please consider sharing our content and, of course, subscribe press that little bell button right down there on YouTube so that you get an announcement when we go live. And for you, those of you who are ready subscribers and those of you who are ready supporters of the show, thank you. I very much appreciate it.